was actually seven when I first discovered music. Got my first guitar at 11. And around that time, um, I was listening to sort of rock and roll coming out of America. Uh, the Skiffle era came about, then there was Cliff Richard and the Shadows, um, and then the Beatles. And really it was sort of through the Skiffle era, I think I got interested in playing the guitar. And, uh, but of, of all my, the things that happened to me, probably the Beatles were the most traumatic, in the most beautiful way, experience that I, I'd ever had. And, and then I really decided that that was gonna be my, my life, if I could do it. I wanted to just play music. I wasn't very good at school. Uh, I was lucky that my parents also encouraged me in my music. I think if I'd have been, had some sort of academic acumen, then possibly they might have pushed me away from it. But um, as it happens, they were both artistic uh, people and uh, recognised that I had a, a gift and, and encouraged me. So really it was the, the environment was, was perfect for me. And when, when you first you know, picked up a guitar and started learning, did, it, did you find it came naturally to you or did you have to graft? No, I didn't graft. It was very natural. I was very lucky. I actually wrote some weird, horrible little thing on the first day I got my, my first guitar, which was uh, given to me by a cousin of mine who'd been, to, um, he'd been away on holiday to Spain. And he bought this guitar, it was about a I don't know, about five dollars it cost or something. And it was absolutely terrible, but it did make a, a nice sound. And it was, it was really difficult to play, but I, I took to it right away and I, I sort of bonded with it. And I thought, that, yeah, this is for me. And at that stage, you know, did you become kind of like completely obsessed by music and playing guitar? Completely and... obsessed, absorbed. There was nothing else I wanted to do other than music. And when, when did you play your first gig? first gig was probably uh, at a school uh, talent show that they had. And this was during the Skiffle era. I was at that point trying to play the drums. Uh, and I had this sort of bongo thing. Uh, a friend of mine had a guitar, so he was in at the guitar as a guitarist. He couldn't actually play it, but he had one. So that was all that mattered. Another one of the boys was playing a uh, kind of like a something that was supposed to be like a bass which was a piece of string on a on a um with a, p a pole attached to a box and it made some kind of dum 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 sound uh and I, I can't even remember what song we sang but uh that that was probably the first gig and i don't know whether i don't remember it that well so i can't say i was suddenly thought oh i you know i want to be you know a, a, a performer all my life you know or anything like that but that was the first gig but then I started getting involved with um, local bands, quite a few different ones. Some of them did, did quite well, but it was really, we were just sort of amateurs really. But it did... Um, but you got signed to HMV. Yeah, we got signed them, to... I was in a band called The Whirlwinds. We got signed to, um, to the HMV label and made our first record actually at uh, Abbey Road in Studio 2. Wow. The hallowed grounds of. And uh, what year was that? That was about 62, 63, I think. So the Beatles were around. One of the boys said he thought he saw McCartney, but I never saw anybody. It was quite early days, though. Even Very early then. days. Um, and uh, it was a, we recorded a Buddy Holly song uh, called Look At Me. And uh, I hadn't really done that much writing at that point. But Lowell Cream, who was a friend of mine, who, of course, I later, later went on to be in 10CC with, uh, he wrote the B-side uh, of that, that song. So even from those very, very early days, there was a, a connection with, uh, although it would be some 10 years later that it actually happened with 10CC, uh, but Lola and I were connected. Uh, and also uh, Kevin Godley went to the same uh, primary school as me. So, and he played in a, a, a band um, that used to rehearse at the same club that the Whirlwinds used to rehearse. And so I got to know him and eventually nicked him for a, a band, I, a, a new band that I started called The Mockingbird. So uh, in that band, there was actually half of 10CC. So we were kind of, our connection started very early on. Yeah, it seemed like you guys kind of 
cross paths with each other and were in bands with yeah. each other throughout yeah. the 60s. Yes. But then, of course, you became very successful as a songwriter. Yeah. And um, yes, I was playing in bands. I always wanted to, loved playing in bands, didn't want to be a front man, but just wanted to, just the joy of playing with other musicians, really. And um, really inspired by the Beatles, I, I started writing songs. Um, the songs that I wrote for our band, nothing happened with, but the songs I gave to other artists became very big hits. Was so that, was what was the first time that that happened? The first time it happened was with uh, For Your Love, which was eventually Yardbirds. recorded by the Yardbirds. That was one of two songs that uh, we recorded um, with the Mockingbirds and uh, our record company turned it down, which kind of worked out quite well in a way in the long run because it eventually found its way to the Yardbirds and became the first song that I'd wrote that became a hit. And did you enjoy the process of seeing your songs taken by other artists and performed by other artists? Or did uh, you yeah, think, yeah. I, w I wish I was like... Uh, no, I'm asked that quite a lot. I was really happy. I mean, who yeah. wouldn't be happy with having, particularly a band like the Yardbirds, who I was a massive fan of of anyway um, I just took it as a massive compliment that they would want to record something that I'd written um, and that actually started off a, a run of three records uh, with, with the Yardbirds they recorded another song of mine Heart Full of Soul and um, there was a B-side or it's like a double A-side called and the song that I wrote was Evil Hearted You These... so it was, it was the start of a very uh, a very good run um, for me of, of writing songs. And it, was, it was kind of like one of those things where you, peop, if you're lucky enough to ever have this ha to happen in your life, well, whatever you do is right. You know, it's like everything is just finds its place. It's kind of like it's your time. Um, and I had uh, two hits with the Hollies, Look Through Any Window and Bus Stop. Bus Stop, yeah. And Herman's Hermit's No Milk Today. And, and so when, when you write, is... Is it always different? The, the mechanics of it are pretty much the same. The, the starting point might be different, but what happens after that is pretty much the same. So sometimes I start with a, a title, which can come from something I've heard somebody say or overheard somebody say, or something you read in a paper or somebody says something on the news. So. I used a line in a song I wrote recently which came from someone talking about the weather. He said, uh, we're going to have uh, s uh, sunny spells and scattered showers. And I thought that was quite a nice line, that life can be a bit like that, that there's a, we have sunny spells and we also have scattered showers. So it, it's your songwriter's sort of radar pick, picks that sort of thing up. Um, and of course it's different if you're collaborating because you're your writing partner might come up with a title or the, an idea for the song and then you sort of work on it together. And do you prefer the collaborative process or solo writing? I don't mind actually, I like both. I find it, it's kind of slightly easier in a way if you're, if you, you have, you're collaborating with someone. Um, and also you do things, you, you might play something sort of absentmindedly and your partner will go, what was that? You go, I don't know. I, I'm just sort of messing around. Say, no, that's really good. You know, so that sort of thing. Happens. Yeah. Um, McCartney always tells the thing about you know Hey Jude about him wanting to take that line out of the song and Lennon saying No, no, you'll leave that in. It's the <laughs> yeah. best bit. Yeah, there you go. So the uh, so you need somebody. Sometimes somebody else can can see things or hear things that you don't. And so I, I always kind of like to because you've had so much success. I always like to ask people who've had this much success mm -hmm. about you know the struggles along the way or if there were any struggles any <laughs> periods of hardship but I think in your case um, I think it it was you know from from reading and, and yeah. researching it was your time in New York uh, was, was that would, would you say that that was the hardest struggle on the way to uh, was, I mean I guess it, you'd already had a lot of success by well, that point I'd had a lot of success as a writer uh, yeah as a writer I went to New York uh, to work with uh, a couple of guys called Cazanets and Cats. And they were famous for uh, bubblegum music. And uh, so it was an odd thing for me to do, but I'd hit a bit of a kind of a, a slump. This was in the late 60s. And I just wanted to try something different. 
but I didn't want to write bubblegum songs, that was for sure. But they wanted to get be involved with writers that were more sort of high end, if you like. And uh, I enjoyed it part of the time, and then I got totally fed up with it. Now, during this period, I, uh, Eric Stewart and a guy called Peter Tattersall had started a studio in Stockport uh, uh, called Strawberry Studios, and I became a partner in that. So uh, I said to them, to Kaznets and Cats, I said, I'm going home. I'll take all the songs that I've done, but I want to record them with the guys that I know in the studio that I'm a partner in. And they said, fine, go ahead and do that. Well, the other guys were Eric Stewart, Kevin Godley, and Lowell Cream. While I was in America, they had a, a massive hit with a, a song called Neanderthal Man, and they were uh, known as Hot Legs. So really, they were a studio a band that was born in the studio. Um, and I came back, uh, we went on the road supporting the Moody Blues. I, you know, I joined the Hot Legs band. After that, nothing happened. And we sort of kind of retreated back to the studio, which had become our kind of second home, really. We became kind of like the house band there. We were playing on other people's records, producing them, writing them, doing all sorts of stuff. Uh, and really, it was partly to keep the studio going because it was good for business. And also, but the main thing was, Whatever we were doing, we really enjoyed it, and we enjoyed working together. So what were some of the records that, that you guys played on and, and produced? Well, we did, there were some football records. There's uh, one called Manchester City, which apparently they still play at the beginning of the, their games. We did one for Everton Football Club. We did uh, two albums with Neil Sedaka, and that was really a bit of a turning point, um, working with him, uh, because he... He kind of, I think he inspired us in a way to, to do more stuff of our own. And so when the studio wasn't working, uh, we would go in and just write and record just for our own pleasure until we hit on um, a song called Donna, which was originally going to be a B-side for a song that Eric and I had written called Waterfall. Um, and because we were very democratic. We said, well, it's only, it seems only fair as so we've written the A-side, or what we thought was going to be the A-side, uh, you should write the B-side. And they came up with Donna. And really, pretty much as we started recording it, we knew there was something special about it. And um, eventually that went on to become our first uh, UK hit. And were you guys always, you know, friend, you know, very friendly and um, kind of like quite open? Because, you know, it, even trying like that, falsetto voice on Donna mm. and stuff like that you know th these these type of fun things require like a really good atmosphere don't a they? very good atmosphere very positive very supportive of each other uh, we had some really good uh, principles I mean one of the things we would do was whoever wrote the song and usually it was either two of us would have written the song the other two adopted it as if it was their own and worked on it as if it was their own uh, Nobody ever said, I don't like it, I don't want to record it. It was, if you think it's good enough, I'll go along with it. But the only thing is, allow me to make some changes or some suggestions. And it was a really, it was really healthy good. atmosphere. The other thing that we did as well was, whoever was best for the job got the job. Whether it was, that was worked out mainly in who sang lead vocals. Uh, because there were four vocalists in the band. But it, sometimes it could be, you know, who was going to play lead guitar um, so it, it, it worked out really really well and so because it's been you know covered a lot the really innovative things that you guys did in the yeah. studio um, and it, it you know it really is just incredible what would be interesting to know is so these these sort of periods of time like when you were making I'm not in love for three weeks or you know it seemed like you guys spent a lot of time in the studio together it was uh, it was well, it felt like 24 hours because particularly when you're involved in a, making an album, you may go home, you know, but you're really just thinking about the work all the time. It, it, it doesn't stop. And so, yeah, my, my, my kind of question on that was, were you just 
completely fully immersed in that work was that or were there times like you know where, where you guys were just off doing other things or partying or whatever or were, were you mm -hmm. just completely immersed in the music we were completely immersed in the music remember it was pretty much our stu our, our studio um, and and so once we started a project we just stayed within it I mean we'd have weekends off but sometimes we worked till quite quite late at night uh, but that was just the way of it, and it felt it felt very good. I mean, our families at the time were incredibly patient, you know, looking back, um, that, uh, you know, it, it could have been disastrous. Well, for some of us it was, <laughs> as it happens. But uh, it, it was one of those things where it had to be done. It was just like we'd been given this gift of coming together the chemistry of the four of us working together was just so brilliant we loved working together and we had all these different influences that that you know you can hear in 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 the music and the, the diversity of the music that we uh, produced so it was a it was a brilliant time it, it's it's incredible music and uh one thing one thing i'd be curious to hear your take on is um do you feel that you are that 10cc are underrated particularly and specifically with regards to the harmonies um compared to bands like when people talk about 70s bands mm. um late 60s bands you know for great harmonies they'll, they'll say queen or yeah. or eagles or you know yeah. maybe crosby stills and nash but i mean particularly with regards to queen like 10cc kind of came first yeah. with that stuff well, yes, uh, th there are a lot of comparisons between us and Queen. Of course, the major difference is, and I think this is probably one reason why 10CC are not in the public's conscious, or conscience as much as Queen, is the fact that we didn't have, really have a front man. You know, we weren't a kind of a sort of showbiz, uh, you know, mad performing performing band I don't mean mad I mean just like a performing band yeah, with there someone a Freddy. Uh, no Freddie and uh, no Brian May in fact you know their records are so identifiable not only because of Freddie's voice but Brian May's guitar playing as well but with us because people chopped and changed and there were particularly most importantly I think different vocalists on different records uh, that we were less identifiable um, I think that's a very, you know, that's a good way. It's, I mean, that's just a like a thorough yeah. analysis of yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, for, for really, 10CC, and I, I think the Beatles share this, we had three number one records with three different singers. So it, maybe it made, made, made us harder to identify. Um, I mean, it was a thoroughly collab. It was a band, wasn't it? Was it? A band. Yeah. it was a band. Yeah, a band, and it was a joy because of that. And, and it was a very... It felt very equal most of the time. Um, it wasn't perfect, but it was pretty much perfect. And so, I mean, you've, you've probably expressed different opinions on this throughout the years, but do you feel at the moment that, you know, it, do you feel any uh, kind of sadness that you guys didn't continue longer? Yeah, I do. I do. I was really upset when Kevin and Lyle left the band in 76. They wanted to pursue their own projects. Um, they effectively sort of <laughs> walked out of the gold mine, if you like. Um, but Eric and I decided after a lot of discussion that we should retain the name 10CC and carry on. And we carried on very successfully. You know, we had a number one record with Dreadlock Holiday things to do for love which is a massive hit in america and that still has things to do for love has that kind of those sonics you know the minute the record comes in it's just like oh um, yeah. like, what is this like you're like you're being woken from a dream or something yeah yeah that's nice i like that <laughs> i mean it is one of those records where you're just like yeah and and often the first couple of times uh, that i heard it you know you just i kind of before the before the actual verse comes in i just yeah. wonder what on earth is this yeah that like, intro is yeah it just says here we are. Okay. Yeah, it's just amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so you yes, did c continue collaborating we and did, creating uh, in the same way. We, we, yes. So Eric and I carried on. We brought in different people into the band. 
uh, and it worked out really, really well until sort of late 70s, early 80s, when things started to disintegrate uh, somewhat. And in the, in the early 80s, Eric and I decided to call it a day. Uh, at that time, uh, I had already met Andrew Gold, um, who came to us uh, because our American record company wanted Eric and I to work with an American writer producer. I think the idea was that we would possibly be able to sell more records in America. That didn't work out as it happens. However, the, the, the bonus for me was, that, was meeting Andrew. And Andrew and I worked together uh, during the 80s. Uh, we formed a band called Wax. And we just had a fantastic time, very creative, a lot of fun. We got on really well together. And um, it was great. And we, we, after that run during the 80s, Andrew and I kept uh, in touch with one another and had been planning to do another record until he, he passed away uh, um, in 2011. Wow. It's a shame that you guys so, didn't get to do that. No, we never got to do it. We did, we did continue writing together and did some really great stuff. Um, but uh, we were talking about doing another wax record, at, and then, but that was not to be. But I have wonderful memories of working with him, and he was a genius. Yeah, yeah, he was a he, he was a brilliant musician. Yeah, brilliant. Um, how how does it feel to still be playing live and making music? It feels great. Uh, I it's I'm very fortunate that in my work life, the three things that I do I absolutely adore, and when I'm doing either any of them, I always think this is the best thing I can possibly do. And that, that's writing, recording and playing with the band, which I love. Because we've still, you know, I've got my version of 10CC still tours. Two of the boys in the band, well, Paul Burgess was the drummer that joined the original 10CC when we went on the road. He's with me. Rick Fenn on lead guitar, who has uh, joined the Mark II uh, 10cc with with me and Eric when we reformed the band in 76 after Kevin and Arthur left um, and people seem to accept this as the 10cc but it's it's a, a live band it's not a recording band I wouldn't do that it just doesn't feel right but to keep them the existing music of 10cc alive in that way feels quite justifiable to me I, I think it certainly is, because there yeah. are a lot of people who want to hear that music. Yeah, well, uh, the fact is our tours sell out, so, you know, there's a de obviously a demand for it. And yeah. we've got a really... And, and people keep keep discovering it. And it's, people it's amazing keep discovering it, and of course, over the years, then you see, you know, different generations. So there's the age group that one would expect, um, the boomers, and... Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, okay, boomer. Um, and then you've got, like people of my kids' age, and then their kids as well start coming to see quite young people as well. It's great. It's lovely. And how, how many shows do you guys play a year? I, do you know? I don't know, but we're, we're, next year we will be solid from the end of January till the end of May. Huh. And then there's stuff later on in the year. There's a break uh, in, in the year. But, uh, so it's really, really very busy. I can't, I've never. I, ne I don't know why I don't count them up, but I could do. I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's but it's pretty. You know, it's, it's pretty, pretty solid. Full on. Yeah. Solid tours. In fact, I've got one day off between a a, um, a European tour and a, an Australian tour, and I'm already planning what I need to do in that particular day before I've got to go out to Australia. And do you ever do you ever sort of think of this or describe it as grueling, or is it just actually a, a joy? I'd say most of the time it's an absolute joy. One of the reasons is not just because of the music, because of the, 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 the guys that I'm, I'm working with. You know, we kind of love each other, basically, and we get on really, really well. That's really important in a band that... I know there are bands, famously, who don't get on, who do very, very well. Um, but for me, I don't need any of that anymore. If, if something's not right, I get rid of it. Don't have a it's not, it's not necessary. And um, so I enjoy the company. I, l I love the camaraderie. It's almost like you, you're being in a gang again. I mean, I have to admit that it, it's something great. And my wife, 
bless her, she's so great about it and understanding. Uh, and of course, I, when I can, I, I, you know, she'll travel out and join, join me on, on the road. Uh, but she has her own uh, uh, career, so, um, so it's a bit of a balance. But um, just the joy of, of playing with people that you like and playing music that you, you love is, is brilliant. What are your favourite 10cc deep cuts? Because you obviously will get asked about the hits all the time and oh, they, speak for, they speak for themselves. Um, I kind of be interested to know what you think off the top of your head you should go and listen to. You mean like first. songs that are not that Songs favorite. that you don't maybe right. even play in your set or songs that... Because obviously you kind of have to do quite a lot of things that yeah. you're expected to in a live show. Okay. But then there are the fans who, who, know, who go a bit deeper and all that. What are your what are your favourites? Okay, I can't remember what album it's from. I think it was from the Bloody Taurus album. But I wrote a song called "I Hate to Eat Alone." The lyric of that song sort of describes, you know, what was happening in my life at that time. Um, that's certainly one. And there was another song called "Lifeline" that I wrote um, about a. Um, how can I be, put this delicately? A relationship I shouldn't have had uh, with someone a long, long way away. And so the telephone became the lifeline and that was what that referred to. So off the top of my head, those two, actually both about sort of, funnily enough, I don't know why, but relationships that have gone wrong. And my final question is, um, and people have answered I mean, differently every single time, but it's always someone who you'd say, yeah, they're, they're amazing. Who are your favorite artists of all time? Got to be the Beatles. I wouldn't be talking to you now if it wasn't for them. Simple as that. Well, I, I think that's probably the answer most people have given and <laughs> I know. it's easy, easy, to, easy to, to, to know why. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Graham. It's been My a pleasure pl to talk to you. My pleasure, thank you.